So, because I knew I would be the last speaker of the day, this is the third day, I know, we have been here for quite some time, I tried to make this presentation, how could I say, not so in, uh, theoretical, I tried, to, I tried to make something a bit more lively a bit, so we don't fall asleep, because I know it's half past three, yeah. So, I started that picture because that's the place where I spent over one year of my life, that was like my home sweet home. My grandmother doesn't understand why I had to become a landless person to get a degree. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I was there, I'm good, I survived, and I got what I wanted, what I needed. So, let's go there. So, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What I'm presenting here is part of my PhD research, uh, the moot site ethnography. Here, that landless camp is just one of the sites in the Brazilian site where I was doing my research. From there, I got 47 interviews over these 15 months in total. And basically, that's my argument here today, not for the whole thesis. Uh, proximity has allowed the formation of transnational space between. Notes that I put it between commas. You get why in a moment. Okay, having said that, what I mean by proximity? I'm not talking about geographical proximity only. I think that would be quite naive. Having read quite a lot, having seen different cases around the world, if you understand proximity as a geographical proximity only, it, I would be falling in my own trap. And the other important point uh, I want to make here is that uh, what I mean by between, that I put between commas, in doing my field research, my findings showed me that locals living in Brazil and Paraguay, they tend to refer to that region as if that was a space between Brazil and Paraguay. It's funny because I've had a Brazilian motorbike, I went to Paraguay to fix the motorbike, a Paraguayan mechanic said, look, I came to live in the frontier because it, I, don't, I didn't like Paraguay. He said, but you are in Paraguay. He said, no, but here's frontier. It's not Paraguay. He said, well, politically, yes, it is. And I was there with my motorbike because I knew it was Paraguay, it would be cheaper. So, and they know it. Just go back a second, a word that I should have mentioned before is Brasiguayo. Because I'm saying that my research is on the everyday practices of that group, but who are these Brasiguayos? The word Brasiguayo actually comes from the Brazilian words Brazilian and Paraguayan. So you put them together, you get this Brasiguayo. That has been identified used by this group of people I'll be talking about in a second. Uh, they started using it end of the 70s, who have some written evidence from the beginning of the 80s. Those are the Brasiguayos. Some people put them the half Brazilian, half Paraguayan. Some people say Brasiguayos, they're the ones who are not really Brazilian, not quite Paraguayan. So it's still in a great area to understand who are the Brasiguayos. And one point that I'm going to highlight is what Albuquerque called the widening of the border. Alargamento da fronteira, for those who can speak Portuguese and Spanish, or the, the other. So, within that framework, what I want to talk is about that region, which is the one Albuquerque said has enlarged to the Paraguayan side. Why is he saying the, the borderline has enlarged to the Paraguayan side only? Just look at the number of Brazilians we have there nowadays. Well, that's just under, un, well, I would say that's quite an underestimate because we talk about one million Brazilians just in that green region of Paraguay, near Brazil. You, you're going to understand why in a moment. So I mean, I want to point that is, look at the number of Brazilians between 6 and 70s, how those numbers just skyrocket. Why Paraguay? didn't have any migration policy. So why Brazilians went there? This is the first question. First, uh, in Brazil, land, land reform didn't work. Uh, they failed to succeed. Brazil didn't do quite well. On the other hand, the Paraguayan government wanted to uh, develop that region, which at the time was just a big jungle. So the Paraguay started creating land policies, not migration policies. So they got Brazilians there, today we talk about one million, but we still don't have migration policies and most of those Brazilians, they're there illegally. We still don't have precise numbers, but we talk about a million. So that's the first written evidence, which is from 1981. Well, I was born actually, it's quite old, but yes. And 
I still have it and I find it quite interesting because it gives a flavor of what I had in my interviews, which was six months ago, a year ago, some of them. There are four important aspects here that I want to highlight, which I don't think the reporter actually knew what they meant when he used those words, and I don't think my interview is actually new, but I find it quite interesting how it's perceived and how it's presented. Nation. Can we talk about those Braziguayos? The Brazilians in Paraguay initially as a nation. We can discuss that for the rest of the year. The homeland of the Brazilians. Well, until a moment ago they were Brazilians, now they're migrants, now where's homeland? I think it triggers to think. There's another word, wow, that's becoming a bit more. <laughs> and there's another one to finish. The country, ooh, imagine. Actually, there, uh, I removed the slide here, but I'm going to mention, because there's a fake article published on 17th of March, 2014, saying that the, those people had requested the Brazilian president to annex that region to Brazil. So that green region I showed a month ago would become Brazil. You have no idea what happened in the land last camp. A bunch of people want to go back to that region, because that region would no longer be Paraguay, it would be Brazil. So it's basically be the same land, the same farm, but so it meant quite a lot. So, but no, it's not going to become part of Brazil. It's not going to become an independent nation or country, at least not for now. So, 1985, that was the big moment for the Brazilians. About 1,000 self-defined Brazilian families, uh, they went back to Brazil overnight, out of the blue. They were uh, camping outside the town hall of Mundo Novo, which is just on the border of Paraguay. And I asked them, how did they get there? The landless movement in Brazil. They literally put those people on trucks, buses, and took them overnight. Why? The Brazilian government was stopping them from entering Brazil. We're talking about Brazilian citizens here. The, the police in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul were literally stopping them. But the police, they couldn't get back to Paraguay, because the police wouldn't accept them in Paraguay. Which became a sort of crazy situation in that moment. And the other interesting thing is that to join this landless camp outside the town hall, they need to show the permiso, which is the visa paper they need to enter Paraguay. So any family arriving saying, look, I came here to join the, this landless camp because I'm a Brazilian. Okay, show me you're a migrant in Paraguay. How? Showing the permiso. Which is quite tricky because some people are there for 10, 15 years. That permiso is valid for two months only. So, so people are actually going there back and forth. So they could always get one. That isn't that hard. And what happens? They were settled. Ooh, finally. We have to get rid of 1,000 families outside your door. So they put them in an area of Iviema, which is now a town. It actually became a town 20 years ago. They got the emancipation. It's now known as the city, the town of the Brasiguayos. It's near the border. It's something really interesting I got uh, last year that they had a dramatization of the arrival of these people in that town for the creation and so on. I found quite interesting because they're trying to reproduce the event from 1985. And they tried to talk to them and say, well, what's it about? I knew actually, but well, I was plain naive. I said, look, it's because we are part of Paraguay. We, we are the Brazilians. We're here between both countries. So they always use this between. And here is how I ended up in the landless camp, the one where I used to live to, to become a doctor, like my grandmother said. Uh, I was traveling. Uh, something was quite wrong, we realized. The guy stopped the coach, the driver. I went out, there was this, this guys. As, I don't know how much you're familiar with the landless movement in Brazil, but basically the way of protesting is usually blocking a highway. So after two, year, two hours, when they managed to get the police and have a chat and liberate, and let people go, uh, I told the driver, you know what, I'm staying. <laughs> I got my suitcase, I stayed there for a day, and then that's how I ended up getting this group of people in my research. So that's the region where this claim to be a part of Brazil somehow. And the other side is the area where is this landless camp I'm talking about, is this town where we have the Brasiguayos, the landless camp where I spent my good years. 
My findings, I'm showing three fragments, they're quite small and short, but I think they give uh, a flavor of what I got there. I'd rather use them, their own words. It's translation from Portuguese, by the way. Some of them don't, don't really make much sense because it's quite hard to translate certain quotes. But I think there are interesting points we could take away and think. <laughs> Delmar. I love how he would take his wife pregnant to Brazil on the day when she was due to deliver the baby. So he'd have to be really fast because sometimes there's not enough time. Even so, he made it, and he'd get back to Paraguay on the same day, and he highlighted nice that he still had an address in Brazil after 20 years, because he needed it, so to prove he was living in Brazil to have assistance. And I have Brazilian Paraguay, because he was born in Paraguay, but has two birth certificates, one in Brazil, one in Paraguay. <laughs> There's a way you can go around there. Actually, I made a joke with Professor uh, Robin Cohen last year when we met here. If he wants to become Brazilian, we can help him out. We can always go around. We just need someone who's older than him to say, look, I saw him being delivered. We just need a witness. <laughs> so if anyone wants to become a Brazilian here, you know, we talk later. Remember, I need a witness. Uh, Jane, that's another lovely interview. Uh, okay. She came with the landless people, they went there, they still working there, they start in the 80s, so the landless movement people in that state has been quite active in Paraguay oh, as well. So they came on a truck, that's on a lorry actually, they came early in the morning, overnight, as if they were illegal immigrants. So why? I mean, you're Brazilian, you just enter Brazil. So, and something that she said that, that I was arrived in the Brazilian part of Paraguay, which is in that green region. I showed you before. And something fun. Okay, Brazilian born in Paraguay. I love when they say that. Because, well, I say, well, first time I was playing the naive. Say, Excuse me, if you're born in Paraguay, I think you're Paraguay. You know? No, 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 no. I'm Brazilian. My mother's Brazilian, therefore I'm Brazilian. Because they wouldn't register the children there. They actually registered them in Brazil. In her case, she only got her birth certificate at the age of 33. But there's a point, she had two children before that. How can she go to the hospital without an ID? She used her sister's Brazilian ID, the ID card. So she'd give birth and then tell the police that the hospital said, look, you know what? It's my child, but I don't really have papers. I don't have a birth certificate because I was born in Brazil. I went to Paraguay as a baby. They never registered me and so on. One year later, she let it go and she said, no, you know what? I was actually born in Paraguay. <laughs> So she managed to get the Brazilian papers, even so she wasn't born there. Third one, I only use F because of a range of legal reasons. He talks quite a lot about Fronteira, and he goes back and forth between Brazil and Paraguay, and he talks quite a, a lot about being within, dentro of that region. And one thing that really got my attention is that he doesn't have a birth certificate. He doesn't have any single sort of identification. He doesn't exist for the government. Well, actually, there are two people in that landless camp who doesn't really exist if you were to end of the government. And they have no interest whatsoever to get an, uh, an ID card or birth certificate in the coming years. I wonder why. Because, come on, if you need a driving license, uh, you don't exist. Even so, they're living under those conditions. So, a few points I want to highlight here. So, Proximity, going back to what I meant in the beginning, the nearness, the closeness between what it allows, what it differs from other cases, at least in this particular case, my finds were there. Transnationalism there takes a slightly different form going, but well, it's faster, it's cheaper, in terms of variety, the intensity and frequency, because remember, have 50 miles, 50, well, less depending where you are, Okay, claiming residence in both countries, it's important. Voting, because those people can vote in both countries, that's something that uh, I'll get back to the why in a moment. Citizenship, because remember, they're citizens of both countries. Okay, transnationalization of politics. Brazilians, I would say the product of the migration process back and forth, and the ties. One thing that happened uh, when Mr. President Lugo left uh, the presidency in Paraguay and we had Franco, 
Federico? Is that the self-defined Brazilians remain in Paraguay when you have a chat with the president in Paraguay, and then they will have a chat with the Brazilian president. So they declare themselves as Brazilian nationals, but they still claim themselves Brazilians because they believe they're in a sort of gray area, and they want the Brazilian president to look after them in Paraguay, which can question how much he can do. So after that, they just have a, a thought, and they talk in a moment why. So my main conclusions for this specific paper today is, in that region, the proximity really shapes the understanding of the territory, the region where they live, how they perceive it, Number two, uh, practices that we sometimes don't see in other countries, like two birth certificates, you don't see that very often. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot do that, let's say, between the Philippines and UK, I uh, hope not. <laughs> okay, and the other thing is, the most important, the last, would be the, how they understand this transnational space as if not Brazil and not Paraguay. And here, thought, the first picture I took of them was when the coach had to stop, full of people. This is the last time I went to visit them. I went there and said, where is everyone? And the lady looked at me and said, Marx, remember, those people are voting in Paraguay. We have local elections in Paraguay. They are in Brazil claiming land. They're here for the Brazilian rights. However, when we have elections in Paraguay, they send us a coach. We go there, we vote. Because if they eventually go back there, it could, could be beneficial. But they're not going there, back there. She said, who knows? They make sure they have the correct mayors there, because they may get back there. So I think that's it. And I love the picture. <laughs>